Okay, so it's uh, um, so welcome everyone to the the Infosys Chandrasekhar and Random Geometric Colloquium series. That it's a pleasure to have uh, Mithul Islam from University of Michigan, who will speak on convex co-compact representations of non-Gromov hyperbolic groups. Okay, Mithul, go on. Thank you to the organizers for the invitation to speak. Um, it is pleasure and an honor to be here and give this talk, although I would have much preferred to be in CIFR in person and give this talk. But I guess we try to make the best of what we can. Um, so here's the talk title of my talk, Convex Co-Compact Representations of non gromov Hyperbolic Groups. I'm a final year graduate student at University of Michigan. Um, and the results that I will discuss during this talk are based on these three papers. The first one is my solo work on rank one Hilbert geometries. And the next two are joint works with Andrew Zimmer at the University of Wisconsin-Madison on convex co-compact representations. And I would like to begin with an overview of the kind of problems that we are going to look at during this talk. So the broad goal here is to study discrete faithful representations, rho of a group gamma into PGL dr, where gamma is a finitely generated infinite group. Now this problem has classical roots and have been studied in many, many areas of mathematics. So here are some examples of some much studied cases that I list here. So when the image of this representation is lambda, which is a lattice uh, in PGL DR, or more generally a lattice in a semi-simple Lie group, this, this kind of uh, problems have been well studied in number theory and geometry. When gamma is the fundamental group of a closed hyperbolic surface, then such representations are studied in Teichmuller theory and higher Teichmuller theory. And more generally, when gamma is a Gromov hyperbolic group, so for example, a free group on finitely many generators, and the representation has this special property called the Anosov property, then such representations are studied in the field of Anosov representations. But the focus during this talk is primarily going to be on the cases when the image of the representation is a non-Gromov hyperbolic group, and it is also not a lattice. So we are primarily going to be interested in the complement of the cases that I listed here. And since looking at all represent such representations of all non-Gromov hyperbolic groups is probably a very ambitious and very unwieldy task, what we will concentrate on are discrete subgroups of PGLDR lambda, which have some nice geometric properties. In particular, we will be looking at those lambda that preserve a convex projective structure or a Hilbert geometry. So these are terms that I'm going to define in a second. And the approach that we are going to take is to study them from the perspective of non-positive curvature, cat zero geometry, geometric group theory, et cetera. So now uh, let me start by giving some introduction uh, and some definitions. So the fundamental geometric object that we are going to look at is a properly convex domain, which is an open subset omega of the projective space with the property that in some affine chart, this omega becomes a bounded convex domain. So what I mean by that is going to be clear once we look at this example. So look at this picture on this slide. So this is a bounded convex domain on the plane of this slide. And then we can think of this slide as an affine chart in the projective space of R3. So that tells us that this picture that you see on this slide is a properly convex domain in the projective space of R3. And it goes back to Hilbert that whenever we have a properly convex domain like this, one can define a canonical distance function on such an omega. And here's how the distance is defined. Given two points x and y, you join the projective line going through x and y it intersects the boundary at two points A and B. So now we take the cross ratio of these four points, AX, Y, B, and take its logarithm. This defines a distance function. And the properly convex domain omega with its Hilbert metric will be called a Hilbert geometry. And associated to any Hilbert geometry is its automorphism group, which consists of all projective linear transformations that preserve omega. And now notice that uh, if we have a projective linear transformation, it is going to take lines to lines and preserve cross ratios. So this automorphism group that um, we just defined is going to act on the Hilbert geometry by isometries. And in fact, this automorphism group is a finite index subgroup of the isometries of omega. 
So these are some of the basic objects that we're going to work with. And once this is set up, sorry, I came in late. Uh, what is the mod a minus y? Uh, so uh, here we are choosing an affine chart, and in this affine chart, we give we endow it with with some Euclidean metric. Okay. So this mod is measuring the distance in that Euclidean metric. Okay. And uh, this is independent of things, is it? Uh, yeah, because uh, any two affine charts are going to be connected by a projective transformation, and this cross ratio is a projective invariant. Okay. It it is not going to depend on. That. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question. So, so that's so these are the big objects. Um, and now, um, oh, sorry, was there a question? Okay. So the next thing that we can think about are geodesics in this in this metric that we just defined. So the projective lines that we are drawing here that I was drawing earlier, these are going to be geodesics for the Hilbert metric. But generically, there are many more geodesics. These are not the only geodesics. So an example here is to consider the properly convex domain, which is a triangle. In this properly convex domain between the two points X and Y, there is a straight line, a projective straight line, which is the geodesic. But then these broken lines that one can draw, like the one through X, Z, and Y, that is a geodesic. And in fact, there are infinitely many such geodesics that one can draw. So this observation is supposed to tell us one thing, that these Hilbert geometries are not always CAD zero, because between two points, we're getting infinitely many geodesics. So recall in the overview, I had said that I want to study them from the perspective of CAD zero geometry. This example tells us that this is indeed going to be something non-trivial and interesting. They're not CAD zero right away. Okay, so I've defined these things. It's good to take a look at some examples. So the first example that I present here you is- You already defined CAT0, uh, really? Oh, uh, no. Uh, okay, so I haven't really defined CAT0. So I, I'm not really going to use the CAT0 definition. So I will just say this, that CAT0 is a generalization of non-positive curvature in metric geometry. And the way you define it is by saying that any triangle that you can draw in a CAT0- yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, 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 okay. yeah, uh, thanks. Than in RN. Okay. Yeah. So one of the examples that I would like to start with is the first example, or rather, the first example of a Hilbert geometry is the real hyperbolic space. So here, what this picture is just an open disk in the affine chart, in the two-dimensional affine chart. So if I take this B and equip it with its Hilbert metric, then I'm going to get something which is isometric to the real hyperbolic two space. And in fact, this affine, this open disk in an affine chart is the projective model of the real hyperbolic space. So more generally, we can take an open ball in a bigger dimensional affine chart, and that gives us a model for the real for all real hyperbolic spaces by going up the dimension. So this example is supposed to tell us that uh, the hyper that this convex projective geometry that I'm talking about is a generalization of real hyperbolic geometry by using real projective space. But a more interesting example was constructed by Benoit using coxeter groups. So Benoit's examples work in some other higher dimensions as well. It is not specific to PGL4, but I'm going to just talk, concentrate on the PGL4R examples. So what Benoit constructed was discrete subgroups lambda of PGL4 with the property that this lambda tiles a three-dimensional properly convex domain omega. And in addition, he showed that this group's lambda have some special properties. The properties being this lambda is Zariski dense, but not a lattice. The lambda is non, not a Gromov hyperbolic group. And it is also the fundamental group of a compact three manifold. So this example it emphasizes that if we really want to study discrete subgroups that are not lattices and non-Gromov non hyperbolic, Hilbert geometries are potentially a good place to start because we will have lots of interesting examples like this. Uh, I want to spend one more minute talking about this example. These pictures down here, these are example pictures of some omega that the group lambda tiles. And now if we look at the picture more closely, these triangles that you see in this picture, when we go down to the quotient by lambda, these triangles project to tori. And if this is the three manifold, then removing the tori that come from these 
triangles, splits up the manifold into some connected components, and then each of these components are going to support a H3 structure. So this tells us that the geometric decomposition of the three manifolds that come out of these examples are particularly, ni particularly nice. And in fact, we will see later during the talk that this is not specific to these examples. This happens more generally for many three manifold group actions on Hilbert geometries. Okay, so that's the second example. And now I want to introduce convex co-compact representations, which showed up in the title of my talk. Uh, uh, Mithil, a question. Uh, what is the class of uh, uh, reducible three manifolds you get in this process? I mean, can you take any two hyperbolic three manifolds with uh, torus boundary components and glue them together along the torus boundary get, uh, and, and then get a convex geometry out of it? Uh, so I, I, I... So as far as I know, so that that is not is not really true, or I should say that that and that answer is not known. Whether we can take any two torus boundary and we can join them and get a convex projective structure, but there are some partial answers in that direct and in this direction. There is a work of Ballas, Dansigan, and Lee where they show that there is this class of uh, something. They have a specific name for it, like H two rigid or something manifolds for which you can actually build a projective structure after gluing along a torus boundary. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. OK. Um, OK. So now, um, yeah, I want to introduce the definition of convex co-compact representations. So here's how what we're starting with. So let's say omega is the Hilbert geometry. And suppose lambda is an infinite discrete subgroup of the automorphisms of the Hilbert geometry. Then the first thing that we are going to define is the limit set. So how do we define that? Sorry, uh, can you yeah. sort of formally define Hilbert geometry? Yeah, so uh, uh, the Hilbert, uh, Hilbert geometry is, is, is this properly convex domain omega with this Hilbert metric on it. And a properly convex domain is an open set in the projective space, which can be realized as a bounded convex domain in some affine chart. Uh, yeah, I think what Ramdas means is that, uh, and you include, uh, include this gamma so that the manifold is omega mod gamma equipped with this metric so that gamma acts by isometries on omega oh. equipped with the. Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah, I see. so I, I, I guess what what I want is some kind of intrinsic structure on the quotient that I can use to recognize that its universal cover is a, a properly convex domain uh, uh, with a Hilbert metric. Uh, I mean, does it make sense? Because I'm trying to connect with stuff I kind of know. So um, what, what is the structure on the three manifold? That is the yeah, um, so maybe you're, you're asking about GX structure. Is that right, Mithun? Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, mm -hmm. okay, oh, OK, I see. So wait, uh, I, I, think the, I think the point is, so if I have a GX, a GX structure, uh, I mean, the way I understand it, so for every, so if I just have a think of a projective structure, then I would say that around every point. So I would think of this, that well, around every point in the manifold, there is uh, a local picture, which is uh, which comes from a projective space, and the transformations between any two charts come um, from a projective domain. So here, what we are saying is that there is so, a so, single... so the transformation comes from what? So that that is point, uh, right? So that is that would be yeah, the G structure, right? So yeah. So, so, uh, so where, uh, here, where is the transformation constrained to? Yeah, so I, I'll say this in a second. So I think so I think the structure is is going to be there like this. So if I have a manifold down here, so what this is saying is that around every point there is uh, there is a neighborhood where everything is in omega, and uh, and and the and the and the structure is going to be restricted to 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 this to this automorphism group of omega. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. So, so the so okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. 
uh, yeah, so I was, yeah, so I was uh, introducing this con the definition of convex to compact representation. And yeah, so the, so the first definition that, that, that I want to introduce was, was limit sets. So suppose we fix a base point P and look at the accumulation point, the orbit starting at P. And that accumulates and look at all such accumulation points in the boundary. Uh, that gives us some limit points. But now I can change the base point that I started with from P to Q and look at more accumulation points. And this give me some more points in the boundary. And we can take the union of all such accumulation points that we get when we vary the base point over all points in the manifold and look at the union of all such accumulation points. That defines the limit point, uh, the limit set for us. So if you're familiar with, or if you've seen the definition of limit sets in real hyperbolic geometry already, uh, you might doubt my definition because uh, we're changing the base point. And then in real hyperbolic geometry, the limit set is base point independent. But this is a feature of Hilbert geometry that whenever you have lines in the boundary, uh, the limit set becomes base point dependent. So this varying the limit, the base points around in the in the manifold in the, in omega, while constructing the limit point, uh, limit set is a way of removing this base point dependence. Okay. Okay. So uh, once uh, I have a uh, just a clarification. So I, I'm not familiar with this definition. So I'm just asking. So how much do you have to move your base point? Do you really need to move it all over the space or is it, if it varies in some compact region, is it enough to capture the whole limit set? No, so for this, you have to move the point all around uh, in Omega. And, and, and the, the picture is essentially this, that if you have this line in the boundary and there are two sequences of points going to the boundary along these lines, then they yeah. always stay within a bounded distance from each other. So if I want to get every point in, so in order to reach this point in the boundary, that things have to move away from any bounded domain in the interior. So should one think of these lines in the boundary as say something like the boundary at infinity of flats, of say half flats or a, or a sector in a flat? Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, intuitively, that's exactly what is going to happen. Like these uh, lines, I mean, it is not precisely true because it is still not known whether given any line, we can put it in the boundary of a simplex or a flat, but intuitively, that's what uh, the picture that one should keep in mind. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so once we have the limit set in the boundary, which comes from looking at all accumulation points of all orbit points, in the interior, starting in the interior of omega, then uh, there is a notion of convexity in omega. Convexity, where by convexity I mean convexity in this affine chart. Then we can take the convex hull of the limit points, and this convex hull is going to give us the convex core. And we will say that lambda is a convex co-compact subgroup if this convex core is non-empty and lambda acts co-compactly on this convex core. Uh, sorry, one more question. So when you define your convex core, is it enough to define it for this first iteration? I mean, it's, is it enough to define it by saying you take all lines joining pairs of points in your limit set, or do you have to iterate this construction? Uh, it is enough to do this once because essentially I think because of this Kara Theodore's result for convex uh, polygons in RD where we, where it says that every convex set is essentially contained yeah. in okay. a nice convex hull. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a good point. So yeah, so now um, if we, so now we can use this definition of convex co-compact subgroups to define what a convex co-compact representation is. And the definition essentially says that, suppose I have a representation of a group gamma in PGLDR, which is discrete and faithful. I'm going to call this representation convex co-compact if the image of this representation is a convex co-compact subgroup for some Hilbert geometry omega. So given a discrete faithful representation, I can, if I can find the omega like this, so that uh, the action of lambda of the image of the representation is compact on its convex core, then I will say that the representation is convex co-compact. So what's the first example? The first example is convex co-compact linear groups. 
So recall, I had said Can earlier. Can one replace omega by c uh, the, the core and uh, so? Uh, so yeah, so the, the the point is that if I have a subgroup with a, a group lambda, which is whose representation in TGLTR is not irreducible, then this omega is not really canonical. One can actually take C and flare it up in both sides and get a different uh, a different convex domain. Yeah. So there can actually be a family of convex domain on which uh, a group acts. That's why it is sort of left free. And also uh, the reason why, one of the reasons that I think is what the reason why we don't put the convex core here is that when we are looking at the geometry of the convex core, we are looking at the convex core with the Hilbert metric coming from omega restricted to it. Because in that metric, this convex core is a closed set. We are not really taking the convex, uh, the Hilbert metric of the convex core itself. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So why convex co-compact line and groups are examples? Well, if we take uh, an open ball in the projective space in an affine chart, then that is a model for the real hyperbolic space. So if we take that open ball as our omega and run through this definition, what we will recover is just the definition of convex co-compact line and groups. So the notion of convex co-compact representations is a generalization of convex co-compact linear groups to PGLDR when D essentially to higher rank elite groups. So the, the basic difference being that in the hyperbolic space, the omega is actually a ball and here it could be anything convex. That's, that's the left generalization. Okay. Exactly. Yes. And okay, so what is the second example? Uh, which is not really a Kleinian group, uh, first thing. So that example is these three manifold groups constructed by Benoit. So these three manifold groups, uh, they are co-compact, they are co-compact, so they are in fact convex co-compact. But we can take any of these convex co-compact, uh, this sorry, these co-compact examples in PGL four R and include it in a bigger group like PGL seven R or PGL ten R. That would be convex co-compact. And in fact these notion of convex co-compact representations are stable under more small deformations. So if we can deform any of the previous representations in this bigger Lie group, then those will also be convex co-compact. And the reason why I'm just talking about the second example is to just emphasize this point that after defining um, this notion of convex co-compact representation, we are actually getting examples of convex co-compact subgroups in higher rank V groups like PGL 7R or PGL 10R that are not necessarily uniform lattices. That's uh, the essential point of having this second example. Okay, so I want to uh, quickly talk about then about uh, the some history and context. Like why do people care about Hilbert geometries and convex co-compact representations? So the first reason in that direction is the generalization is that it gives us a way of generalizing convex co-compact Kleinian groups. So Kleiner, Lieb, and independently Kahn, they had proved a result earlier that if we naively want to generalize the notion of convex co-compact Kleinian groups using higher rank symmetric spaces, then the only examples of convex co-compact subgroups that we will get are going to be uniform lattices. But then this definition using Hilbert geometries actually gives us more examples, which are in fact examples that are not uniform lattices as we saw. So this is a, a non-trivial generalization, we can say, of convex co-compact Kleinian groups. And the second re reason is the connection between Hilbert geometries and Riemannian negative curvature, which comes out of some of the early work of Benoit in this area. So Benoit wrote a series of papers in this, and in one of them, he looked at the following case. So he looked at omega with no lines in its boundary. So these are called the strictly convex Hilbert geometries. And then in addition, he had the assumption that let's say the quotient is compact. Then Benoit proved that these quotient manifolds behave like Riemannian manifolds of negative curvature. So for instance, he showed that the geodesic flow is going to be anosol. And then it, the result all, was also that this lambda 
is going to be a gromofiber volume group. So this was the this was Benoit's result. And now a natural question to ask is if we have a more general Hilbert geometry, so we drop this assumption. Is there uh, the, the, so so you said something about the geodesic flow. So here yeah. the Hilbert geometry is what Finsler? Yes, right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes, so that's it. That, that's one of the, that is also one of the reasons why this is interesting because the we are we are working with the Hilbert geometry, which generically comes from a Finsler structure, and in fact the only time when it comes from a Riemannian structure is the hyperbolic geometry. But then Benoit's results showed that although we are in a in the Finsler world, a lot of Riemannian negative curvature flavor comes out. And so the natural question that one can ask here is what about more general Hilbert geometries? If we drop the assumption of strict convexity, can we still recover some connection with non-positively curved Riemannian manifolds? And this answer is, it is tricky because these are generically not CAD zero. Uh, recall the example of the triangle with where there are infinitely many geodesics between two points. But we will see that in some of the results that are coming up soon, that it is still possible in this situation to develop some analogy between CAD0 and Hilbert geometry using geometric group theory. And yeah, so that is going to be one of the things that I'm going to talk about. And the next thing is Anosov representations and their generalizations. The Anosov representations I have not defined precisely, and I do not intend to do that. Rather, I would talk about a geometric perspective on, on Anosov representations using convex co-compact representations. What are Anosov representations? These are generalization. Uh, these are uh, representations of chromo-hyperbolic groups with good dynamical behavior, defined by Laburi and studied by many authors, uh, Gary Tau Richard. Kassel Winner, Kapovich Lee, Porti, um, Bridgman Canary, Sam Barino, and I'm sure I'm missing out many people who have made good contribution, and I apologize to all of them for that. But so what I'm just, what I'm trying to say is that these Anosov representations of of Gromov hyperbolic groups is very well studied. And then here is one of the ways of thinking about Anosov representations from the from the perspective of convex co-compact representations. So, so if we have a discrete faithful representation of the group gamma. And in addition, we assume that gamma is a one-ended Gromov hyperbolic group, but not a surface group. Then rho P1 Anosov is equivalent to rho being convex co-compact, along with the geometric condition that there are no lines in the boundary of the convex core. So let, let me uh, just pause for a second. So when I'm talking about these groups, one-ended Gromov hyperbolic groups that are not surface groups, uh, an example that you can keep in mind is compact hyperbolic uh, three manifold groups. So for such groups, uh, in 2017, Danziger, Gerito, Kassel, and Andrew Zimmer showed that P1 Anosov, which is a special kind of Anosov, is equivalent to convex co-compact plus a geometric condition. So a natural question that one can ask is what happens when gamma is not gromov hyperbolic? So then on this side, we draw a blank because the notion of Anosov representations that we have right now is defined only for chromofiberbolic groups. But on this side, we do not have that restriction. So one can actually study convex co-compact representations of non chromofiberbolic groups. So this was the title of my talk today. And this, so in this regard, one can think of convex co-compact representations of non chromofiberbolic groups as a generalization of P1 Anosov representations. Uh, so th there is a little worry that I have. So is is do you put in this condition that there are no lines on the boundary of the domain? Uh, is that, is that part of your definition, or are you just looking at convex or compact representation? Uh, you, no, for for non groom of hyperbolic groups. Basically, okay, no. see, yeah. No, uh, there will be we will be allowing lines in the boundary of the domain. Okay, okay, good, good. Because I mean the thing is, they typically at least in those three manifold cases. You're pasting along a torus. Now that torus is going to lift to a flat, and so that should give a line on the boundary. Is that a correct understanding of yeah. what is going on? Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So whenever we don't have lines, 
this theorem tells us that we are going to be in the hyperbolic case. So if we want to study non of hyperbolic groups, we must allow lines. And yeah, so that is the geometry that we will be looking at. So for us, omega will look like this. This is probably a prototypical picture of omega that one can keep in mind when we are going through the results that come up. And so in yeah, uh, yeah, again, just to sort of uh, try to understand that cartoon that you just drew now, will there be, I mean, those lines will be replicated all over the place? I mean, there'll be translates by the group element also? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So there will be, yeah, so there will be, it will be all over the place. But yeah, it's hard to draw. So I just draw this, this small cartoon with two lines. Uh, right. So then, so with the, with non of hyperbolic groups, uh, we're going to study convex co-compact representations of non of hyperbolic groups. And the two classes of non of hyperbolic groups that we will be looking at are relatively hyperbolic groups and closed three manifold groups. I mean, there will be some more adjectives that go with the three manifold groups, but I will come to them when I state the theorems. And uh, the, do you have some restriction on the parabolic subgroups in the relatively hyperbolic case? Yes, exactly. So this, uh, there will be some restrictions and the, uh, it, we will be looking at uh, the peripheral structure coming from virtually abelian subgroups, uh, which are of rank at least two. But yes, but I will uh, discuss them in a little more detail when I get to the theorem. So here is uh, here are some intuitive versions of the main results that I plan to discuss during the talk. So the, this is the sort of an answer to the first question about the connection between Hilbert geometries and non-positive curvature. So what we will be going, what we will show is that the, that we will introduce a notion of rank one Hilbert geometries, and we will show that they behave analogous to rank one cat zero spaces. So what does this rank one mean? This uh, notion comes from Riemannian geometry or Riemannian non-positive curvature to be precise, where there's a dichotomy that exists that if we have a compact irreducible non-positively curved Riemannian manifold, then either there is abundant negative curvature and the manifold is rank one Riemannian manifold, or the manifold is a locally symmetric higher rank, uh, it's a higher rank local symmetric space. So in, this, in the same direction, we would like to quantify this notion of abundant negative curvature for Hilbert geometry. So that's where the notion of rank one comes in. And here's the definition. We will say that an isometric gamma is a rank one automorphism if it satisfies two conditions. The first one is that it has an axis along which inside of omega along which gamma translates. And the second condition is that these axes are not contained in half triangles. So what is a half triangle? Well, here's a quick uh, example of that. In this axis, if we look above the axis in the domain, there's half of a triangle that you can see. So this is a half triangle. We don't want this to happen. On this picture, on both sides of the axis, there are no half triangles that we see. So this is fine. This is what we want. Uh, and if gamma satisfies these two conditions, it is a rank one at one position. And we will say that a discrete subgroup is rank one if it contains a rank uh, one. One more thing. Uh, so the, the axis will necessarily have to have endpoints away. So if it's a rank one automorphism, it, mm -hmm. we should, it, it should be away from the interiors of the lines. Is that correct? Uh, Can an endpoint lie on in the interior of this guy? I mean, so I mean, uh, uh, lie in the interior of mm -hmm. that, that straight line a plus Z. If it's a oh, no, I mean we don't need. Right. Uh, I mean, it could lie in the interior. It could lie in the boundary. Can, can it really lie in the interior? Uh, yes. So, for example, if we if we have a triangle and we we look at the automorphism that comes line that goes from here to here. If this is, let's say this is E2 and this is E3, and this is E1, then the, then this line is going to be an axis with one endpoint in the interior. Ah, I see. Thank you. Yeah. So this, this triangle that I drew is in the projective space. I'm just thinking of projective realization of R3. Uh, so yes. 
So we have the rank one automorphisms, we have the rank one groups, and this is analogous. This, so this definition is essentially motivated by a property of rank one cat zero isometries, where the restriction is that the axis of a rank one isometry cannot lie in a half flag. So the half flags have been replaced by half triangles. Okay. And now what can we do with these rank one groups? Well, we can prove a result like this, where we show, I mean, we can prove lots of analogous results to rank one cat zero groups. And here is a sample of that. For example, we can show that if lambda is a rank one group, then either lambda is virtually Z, which means lambda is essentially generated by one rank one element, or lambda is an acylindrically hyperbolic group. Uh, acylindrical hyperbolicity is a generalization of bromo hyperbolicity um, in geometric group theory. And this is a broad class of well-studied groups, contains examples like mapping class groups, outer automorphisms of free groups, et cetera. So once we have this theorem, we can use all that geometric group theory machinery and prove interesting results about rank one groups. So for example, we can have asymptotic counting formula for conjugacy classes. Um, we can have, show that the second bounded cohomology group of a rank one group is infinite dimensional. So that means these groups satisfied a cohomological notion of negative curvature that was introduced by Mono and Shalom, et cetera. But I do not plan to spend more time on rank one groups. Rather, I want to use this point of view of analogies between Hilbert geometry and CAT zero geometry to study convex co-compact representations. And that's what uh, will take us to our first main theorem. So here we are taking a group gamma with a convex co-compact representation rho. And then <clears throat> we are saying that the following are equivalent. The first condition is that gamma is relatively hyperbolic with respect to subgroups, which are virtually ZK, K at least two. And the second condition is that the convex core has isolated simplices. So this is uh, what Mohan MJ was asking earlier about the peripheral structure. We are saying that our group is going to be relatively hyperbolic with respect to the peripheral structure coming from ZK subgroups where K is at least two. So what is a prototypical example that we, that one can keep in mind when thinking of these relatively hyperbolic groups. So you can think of a cusped hyperbolic three manifold. The fundamental group of such an M is an example of a relatively hyperbolic group of this type. And what does this relative hyperbolicity mean? It means that, well, the fundamental group is not relatively, is not Gromov hyperbolic but that non gromov hyperbolicity comes because there are these tori in the cusp cross section whose fundamental group produces z2s in phi one of them. But this notion of relative hyperbolicity essentially means that all these z2 subgroups which disturb my gromov hyperbolicity are somewhat restricted. And so if we can get rid of them in some interest, some uh, careful fashion, then whatever we are left with is going to be Gromov hyperbolic. So that's what relative hyperbolicity essentially means intuitively. And then we have this second term, the convex core has isolated simplices. What we mean by that, I will try to explain in with a picture. So let's say we have, this is the convex core and the convex core is not round like this. Suppose there are lines in the boundary and those lines form a part of a simplex. So there is a simplex in the domain. And suppose there is a sequence of these black simplices that converge towards, the, towards that red simplex that I drew. In that case, we will say that the red simplex is not isolated. And the condition of isolated simplices says that these kinds of things do not happen. So isolated simplices is essentially the com complement of what you are seeing in this picture. Okay, so that's the statement content of the first theorem showing that algebraic separation of peripheral subgroups is equivalent to this geometric isolation of synthesis. For the second theorem, we are going to consider M, which is a closed. Yeah. So uh, there, there was this, uh, this is, is this something somehow related to CAD zero with isolated flags? Yes, absolutely. Yes, we were completely motivated by the definition of CAD zero with isolated flags. Okay, yeah. So if you take the, this manifold and you cut out the manifolds along these cusp cross sections, whatever you are going to be left with is a cat zero space with isolated flags. 
and yeah so that's essentially where the motivation comes from thanks thanks yeah So M, so here we are considering a three manifold, which is closed, irreducible, and orientable. And let's say rho is a convex co-compact representation of the fundamental group of M. Then one of these two cases are going to be true. Either M is geometric and the geometry is R3, H3, or R cross H2. So generically, if we have a, a three-dimensional compact manifold, then any of the eight Thurston geometries are possible. Here, we are, the theorem says that only three of them will show up if the fundamental group has a convex co-compact representation. And the second conclusion is that if M is non-geometric, then the three-manifold theory tells me that there is a geometric decomposition by removing finitely many Turi and Klein bottle, the collection being unique up to isotopy. And then each of these pieces the theorem says that will have a, will support an H3 structure. So the picture that we saw for the Benoit examples holds true much more generally. Any three manifold M with a convex co-compact representation with, will have this structure. Okay. So in particular, the, none of the pieces can be products with a circle. Is that what yes. your... Uh, none of the pieces will have a cipher vibration. Okay. So next, what I plan to do is to, okay, well, I mean, I should probably mention one more thing here. So this is the structure of M that I just described. Now one might ask what happens with the structure of the convex core. So this is what, what happens with the structure of the convex core. So here is, convex code it projects down to its quotient and in the quotient there will be some panels that correspond to parts of the manifold that go to infinity and then this tori that we are seeing in m this will also show up as tori in the convex code and this tori will be covered by simplices but now in m so recall this M was a, is a three-dimensional manifold. So the two I have for dimension one. So they cut up the manifold into pieces. But then this convex core is a D minus one dimensional manifold because omega is a subset of the D-dimensional projective space. So these two I, when we remove them, it does not cut up the manifold into pieces. And in fact, so I should remark here that this theorem is, uh, is a it's the generalization of a result of Benoit. So Benoit looked at three manifolds of the form omega mod lambda. So Benoit was looking at the case where the convex core is all of omega and omega is three dimensional. And there Benoit proved the same conclusions that we have. But then we have very different methods. Benoit used uh, actions on R trees to get the conclusion, whereas we look at we classify centralizers of abelian subgroups and use that to get the same result. But for us, omega can have arbitrary dimension. So that's essentially the main point of this theory. Okay. So what I plan to do next is to go ahead and spend some more time on explaining theorem one. So for that, I first want to talk about projective synthesis. So I was drawing these simplices in the affine chart. So how do we think of them as projective objects? Here is one way to think about them. If we take the first octant in R3 and projectivize it using some relation, let's say x plus y plus z equals one, then it is going to look like a triangle. And this triangle is a two simplex. Similarly, we can projectify uh, the first, yeah, the first octant or whatever in larger demand in R, R to the D, and that will give me a projective D simplex. And the point, is that these projective simplices of dimension at least two are analogs of flat syncad zero geometry. So now if we have a convex co-compact subgroup lambda, we can consider the set of all maximal simplices in the convex core of dimension at least two. And the definition is that we will say that convex core has isolated simplices if this collection of maximal simplices, script S, is isolated in the local Hausdorff topology. So if you don't want to think about local Hausdorff topology, here is a more geometric way of thinking about them. 
Suppose I take two simplices S1 and S2 from uh, this collection script S. And suppose you fix the R positive and look at R neighborhoods of the two simplices. Suppose this intersection of the two neighborhoods has a diameter which is bounded above this by this constant QR, which depends only on R. Then we will say that the set of simplices in uh, the convex code is isolated. So that's the geometric definition of what isolated simplices would mean. And then, uh, what is the group action like on these flats? I mean, on the on these simplices. So, uh, so the, right. So the group uh, act just acts by the di diagonal subgroup. So here we have this projectivization of R three. So if we take the uh, if we take this diagonal subgroup, it preserves this uh, this simplex. And in fact, so one of the questions that Mohan is asking, I think, it will come from this flat torus theorem that we proved in another joint work. So what that tells us is that if we have a convex co-compact subgroup and there is a maximal abelian subgroup, then this simplex is going to project down to a torus. Thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to know. Thank you. OK, yeah, so uh, in for convex co-compact subgroups, the maximal abelian subgroups correspond to the story coming from the simplex. So that is sort of the moral that one can take away from this flat torus theorem. Okay. So yeah. So and then I am going to. So I was talking about this first theorem. Here's the statement. We 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 have this relatively hyperbolic groups with respect to peripheral subgroups which are virtually zk. And on this other side, we have the geometric property that the convex core has isolated simplices. And as uh, there was this remark earlier that this is uh, analogous to cat zero spaces with isolated flats. And this theorem here is motivated by a theorem of Ruska and Kleiner in the setting of cat zero spaces with isolated flats, although we rely on different techniques to prove this result. Okay, so now I want to spend the next few minutes talking about the proof of this theorem. And the proof essentially goes to this intermediate step, which I call 1.5 where we say that the convex core is a relatively hyperbolic metric space with respect to script S, the collection of maximal simplicities. So let's see how the proof goes. So notice go compactly on the convex core. So there is a quasi isometry between the convex core and the group gamma. And in fact, the flat torus theorem that I was alluding to earlier plus some general results about relatively hyperbolic groups will help us show that every ZK subgroup, K at least two on in gamma corresponds to a simplex of dimension at least two. So this quasi isometry is, is essentially what helps us prove that one and 1 1.5 are equivalent. If the group is relatively hyperbolic, the metric space is also relatively hyperbolic with uh, commensurate uh, peripheral structures. And then this 1.5 implies 2, this also comes from general results and the second characterization of isolated flats that I was, for which I was drawing the pictures. So the main work goes into showing that 2 implies 1.5. And I want to tell you a little bit about how we do that. So that one needs to know what a relatively hyperbolic metric space is with respect to this collection of sets S. But, and this definition is quite complicated with asymptotic cones, but then thanks to Sisto, there is another characterization of relatively hyperbolic metric space in terms of projection maps. And that is what I will state and use. So Sisto proved that a relatively hyperbolic group, uh, space being relatively hyperbolic is equivalent to having this family of projection maps that go from the convex core to, sim to a simplex for each simplex in the collection. And these projection maps need to have a contraction property. And then there is another technical condition that one needs to satisfy. Uh, it has, there's a technical name I think called asymptotically transverse tree, but I'll just call it relatively thin triangles. 
So if we have a metric space with a collection of closed subsets for which these two properties are satisfied, we will be, that is equivalent to saying that the metric space is relatively hyperbolic. So the main work that we have to do is to produce these, con these projection maps, prove the contraction property, and show that the triangles have this property there. And now the question is, so what is the projection that we can look at? And the interesting point is that there are two projections that one can consider. The first one is the closest point projection. There is a Hilbert metric around, so we can use that Hilbert metric to choose closest points. That gives one projection. And this is good because it's connected to the geometry, but it is if I hand you a point, it is very hard to figure out what is the where does the image of the closest point projection lie? Because this essentially depends on the boundary structure of omega. But then what saves us here is the linear projection. Because with a linear projection, it is not clear how it comes, how it connects with the geometry. But for the linear projection, we exactly know what the image of each point is going to be. So what is this linear projection? Suppose we have a two-dimensional simplex in a three-dimensional convex domain. Then for each face of the simplex, we can take a hyperplane. And then each, then these three hyperplanes that we get, they're going to intersect somewhere up here. And this intersection of hyperplane and the simplex gives me a complementary subspace decomposition of R to DT. And then we can just take the projection map for which the kernel is this intersect, intersection of hyperplanes and whose image is the simplex S. That's what the linear projection is doing. And the key result here is that when we have isolated simplices, these two projection maps, the linear projection and the closest point projection are coarsely equivalent. So from the viewpoint of coarse geometry, we can interchange these projections. And uh, that is uh, what, under, under what condition? Can you repeat that? Or is yeah. this, so this is when we have this convex code as isolated synthesis. So this is under the second condition. So when we have isolated simplices, we can just interchange between the two projections. And what and the reason why it helps is that the linear for the linear projection, we know exactly what happens when I hand you a point, and then there's a way of connecting it to the geometry. And in this direction, I would also like to point out one of the key things that helps us in proving everything is the following property. So the property is that there is a constant C positive with the following property that if we have any simplex S in the collection script S and there are two points X and Y in omega, then suppose let's pi X and pi Y be the projections of the two points. If the distance between the two projections is at most C, uh, sorry, is at least C, then the geodesic that goes between X and Y looks like this. So it spends a lot of its time close to the geodesic between pi x and pi y. So it penetrates the ball of radius c around x, it penetrates the ball of radius c around pi y, and everyone in between, it is at most two c away from the geodesic going between pi x and pi y. And this is the property that essentially helps us show that, it had, that the projection maps that we are considering have all the nice properties that we want, and we also have relatively thin triangles. And that is essentially the end of the proof of theorem one. And so there are some implications that come out of theorem one, which essentially is the following. So we know, know we saw earlier that for one ended room of hyperbolic groups, uh, which is not a side surface group, we have this convex co compact group presentation plus no lines, a geometric condition equivalent to P1 Amosov. And then we said that if we have gamma relatively hyperbolic, there isn't really a definition that we can put in this box. But on this side, now we have seen that when gamma is relatively hyperbolic, the no lines geometric condition gets replaced by isolated simplices. So we have lines, we can have lines in the boundary, but the simplices that are associated to this, those lines need to be isolated. And now- uh, So you have excluded surface groups from in the, from the uh, 
uh, Ivan Anusov, I mean, the, from this correspondence on the top, uh, what about, yeah. say, relatively, I mean, say, basically, Fuchsian groups with cusps? Can you incorporate it into this picture? I mean, so that the, the boundaries are now Z and they are not higher rank. I mean, they are not uh, rank two or more. The parabolic guys, the parabolics are rank one. Uh, uh, is is no. there any? Oh, sorry. Is there sorry, a kind go. of theory? Is there is there is there anything that you can say? I mean, for Anusov, uh, you have this this sort of curve where it, there's so much control is not there. It's it's a more flexible gadget, but. Is there mm -hmm. still something one can say? That's I guess my impression. Uh, yeah. So I I think uh, so. So this definitely does not fit into this picture. That is for sure. Uh, I am not really sure. I'm not really familiar with with a notion that would that actually, yeah. So that so I would say that I'm not familiar with a notion that takes into account those things. Maybe the geometrically finite. So here we are looking at convex co-compact guys. Maybe looking at geometrically finite examples could take care of those. And then there's the work of Crampon and Marquee on geometrically finite actions on Hilbert geometries. So maybe that's okay, one of the. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. So so essentially, I mean, I, I guess one of the things that you are saying is, is that if it is convex co-compact, then you really need higher rank to put the flat. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so that's so that's one of the so exactly that's one of the conclusions that we get. Uh, like there are some some more there's some more stuff that comes up after this, and then essentially what that says is that whenever you see a line in a convex co-compact action, this line the boundary actually you can make a flat out of it. And I I should also mention one thing that well so this excluding certain groups that we we were just talking about in getting hold of this, uh, I mean. Essentially, you need to exclude surface groups because you want to have a convex domain that you are preserving, that you, that you want to build out of your E1 Amosov representations. And there are other ways of formulating this theorem where this excluding surface groups do not, does not show up explicitly. But okay, so what I was trying to say is that so on this side of convex co compact representation, we get these isolated simplices. And now a future research suggestion that one could think about and I'm also very interested to figure out is if we whether we can up this correspondence to the level of relatively hyperbolic groups of with definition of relative of one anosov for relatively hyperbolic groups. And I should also remark at this point that there is a definition of one anosov for relatively hyper groups called relative anosov lieb and independently by zoo. But then those notions are going to be very different from the notion that I am talking about here. And that would go into this box and complete this diagram. Uh, I do not intend to go more in that direction, but if you want, you can ask me questions after the talk. Uh, what I had after this was the second theorem uh, was to talk a little bit more about the second theorem on those three manifold groups. But I think we are running out of time. So I can stop here or go on a little bit more, whatever, whatever uh, the organizers think is fine by me. Um, so maybe you can, so you already stated, or do you want to say, maybe take a couple of minutes to say something on this section? Okay, great. I, okay, then I'll just quickly say a couple of things. So what, what I want to say, I mean, I essentially talked about this when I was intuitively stating the theorem. So I said that if we, uh, as we were looking at the thing that if M is a closed irreducible orientable manifold relation, then there are two possibilities either m has one of these three geometries or m is non geometric and there is a geometric decomposition where each piece has a hyperbolic structure uh, and in this case additionally what we will be seeing is that this fundamental group of m is going to be a relatively hyperbolic group with respect to virtually z2 subgroups but this z2 corresponds to fundamental group of tori or klein bottle and then I had planned to draw the pictures here for the decomposition of M and the decomposition of the convex code, but I already drew that. And I also made this remark about Benoit. So I guess we can skip the slide. And then I was going to just spend a few more minutes talking about this key lemma that helps us prove the result. So as I remarked, this Benoit, the result that Benoit proves, he has to build actions on R trees and argue 
about and, and to argue that this three manifolds in the non-geometric case have this special structure. Whereas for us, we rely on this lemma about centralized. What does this what is this Lemonvex co-compact subgroup? Then so here's my line somewhere that we can take our so many into a slice. But like decorate group. And at least slides. That would be that the center is virtually the fundamental group of a closed spherical manifold. I mean, I, this is where I was planning to talk about the proof, but I'll just quickly go through this. So I will talk metric case, the proof in the non geometric case. Uh, the geometric case is essentially very similar. So here, what we get if we have a non geometric three manifold and we look at one of its pieces in decomposition, that piece is not ciphered. Far. And the, the way to that is essentially boil down to this idea that Z times a free group generated by M elements that make convex co compact representations. So, why is that? So, suppose there is a convex co representation of Z, then what we can do is we can take a Corresponding to sense identity. But generally, the centralizer of A is all. And the key Not sure, and that uh, is like uh, thanks, thanks for listening to me. All right, thanks, Nikul, for this wonderful talk. Uh, so, so we get, I guess we had a lot of questions during the talk, but if there are any further questions, um, are there any further questions for Nikul? That's it. You hear the face who shows the uh, only when in parabolic space. Maybe in the second, uh, yeah, the triangle you could have said also that it's isometric to R2 with uh, this hexagonal as a as a as a sphere or the and my question is, rank one that connects with what man asked before. For your rank one sandwiches, could could you you gave that having license? Okay, and a rank one. Uh, okay. uh, right. Uh, so what the things that we can show is that if we have this definition, we can go ahead and show that uh, the endpoints are actually extreme points. And if, and in fact, at each of these endpoints, the hyperplanes that you get are also unique. So this kind of a picture of having an endpoint in the in the middle of a line, it is this is never going to show up. Yes. And in fact, there's more. One can actually show that we can't even have a line segment that starts at this endpoint. So it yeah. is. So the endpoints of rank one isometries are really nicely behaved, as nice as one could want. 
And yes, so thanks for the comment about CAT0. I, I, was, I was not really able to, uh, during the talk, I remembered that I saw this somewhere, but I could not remember the reference. So I did not really talk about Kelly and Strauss's paper. But yeah, so thanks for the reference. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So uh, one uh, one more question, Mithul. Uh, I've asked too many already, but uh, so what about the variable negative curvature group? I mean, say things like I think there's some result of Kapovich, right, which says that these Gromov-Thurston examples yes. carry convex projective structures. So mm -hmm. are there sort of versions of it for for relative hypolarity? Uh, so uh, so Kapovich. Result in convex projective structure. He shows that if you have a variable negative curvature, then omega is so, and the group is a Gromov hyperbolic. That's correct. That's correct. That's in in, in his example. Exactly. So he looks at I think these branch covers. So essentially, you take a hyperbolic manifold and you take a branch cover of that. These are these Gromov Thurston examples, and he constructs. A, uh, so are, are there sort of possible generalizations of that? To the relative hyperbolic setting. Ah, uh, okay. I see. I see your question. I see. Uh, yeah. So this is something that I have been. I would be interested to find out. I don't know the answer to this exactly. I mean, I was thinking of this. I. I don't know much about. Uh, uh, so. So essentially, if I. So I was thinking that if I can take probably take a cat zero cube complex group and then construct a branched cover, like if I can get a dihedral group inside and then construct a branched cover with this, whether something like this holds true. But I don't know enough about cat zero cube complexes at this point to figure out this answer. But I'd be very interested to know if there are other examples that one can construct like this. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. OK. Uh, so if there are no further questions, let's thank Mithul again. Thank you.